This is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, the subject will be the television version of The Odd Couple by Neil Simon. It was a sitcom in the early 1970s, and I think it's one of the best, if not the best, American sitcom of all time. I will be speaking with Diana Peterson, and the conversation will begin in a moment. Diana Peterson is my guest. She will be talking about The Odd Couple television show. She has a blog called The Right Life 61, as I like to usually do. I want to give Diana a couple of minutes to talk about herself, and then we'll get into the show itself. So, Diana, welcome again. This is your third time appearing. If you give a little background about yourself and your interest in the odd couple. Yeah, well, in my real life, I'm an assistant curator and an editor for a museum um, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Uh, I love to write, and I do a lot of writing for work, a lot of um, nonfiction, and I also work on some novels. But... The fun, the most fun I have is doing my blog. Um, as you mentioned, I have a blog called um, The Right Life, W R I T E Life 61.com. I just started my seventh year and we kind of cover everything shows, stars, episodes about advertising, history of TV, um, George Bear's cars, just a wide variety of things. And there's kind of an accompanying podcast with that too. It's called Stay Tuned. Um, if you put stay tuned, Diana Peterson, it's easier to find. There's a lot of stay tuned and that comes out every Tuesday and Friday, um, as well. So yeah, I just, I love TV. I love, um, especially classics that come and the odd couple is definitely one of my favorites too. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, what came before, uh, the television show. Neil Simon was the author of the play, The Odd Couple. Uh, and a lot of people probably know Simon for The Odd Couple or Biloxi Blues, a number of other plays he had from, I'd say, the late 50s through the maybe late uh, 80s, rather. Uh, he was one of the more successful Broadway playwrights. Um, he would write uh, generally about his past, but The Odd Couple, I guess, was a bit of a departure. It was one of his earlier plays. And uh, in looking it over, it looks like uh, that Art Carney was the original Felix on Broadway, and Walter Matthau uh, was the original Oscar. Uh, do you have any comments about the, the play? Um, I don't have a whole lot. I know it was actually based, I believe, on his on Neil Simon's brother, Danny, in his life. So it is based on real um, episode, or a real situation. Um, I've heard really good things about Art Carney in that play. And of course, Walter Matthau kind of nailed the role on both the film and the play. Yeah. I think it went on to for like a thousand performances. It was very successful. Yeah. And uh, it, for me, I always think of Carney as uh, Ed Norton. So it's kind of hard <laughs> to think of him as uh, Ed Norton from uh, the television show, The Honeymooners with Jackie Gleason. It's hard to think of him though as, as uh, Felix. But what's interesting yes. in, in looking it over, when they were casting for the movie, which had Matthau as Oscar and uh, uh, Jack Lemmon come in as the Felix part, I, I heard that they were actually thinking of casting or having Art Carney as Felix and, and then bringing in Jackie Gleason as Oscar, which would have been really kind of meta here because, you know, Carney and Gleason were sort of a great 50s television comedy team. And I think uh, the Klugman and Randall version was a, a great team in the 70s. So that would have been quite interesting to have them if that had happened. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I would have the success. I might be wrong, but yeah. I think it's hard to get beyond them as Ed Norton and Jackie, or, you know, the, well, their characters you. on The Honeymooners. Yeah, um, so at, the film comes out in 1968, a few years after the play became, as you said, a, a Broadway hit. Um, and we have Matthau and Lemon. And the interesting thing is the play is set mostly in the apartment, uh, uh, and so is most of that movie. It's a movie that really is like a film version of the play. There's maybe a few little things like when I think Felix goes to to uh, shop at a supermarket or something, but pretty much it's probably 90% of what the play was. The two boys, their poker buddies, uh, and uh, talking about their divorces, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you have any comments about the, the movie version? Um, well, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I have never seen the movie version. Oh, no? I don't know how I missed that, but... Um... <laughs> That is one of the, on my list of movies to go back to, which is a very long list. I am finding more and more 
Okay. So I will take your word for how you viewed the film. Yeah, it was actually a good film. Uh, it was, I think, the second time that Mathau and Lemon had played together. They played in Billy Wilder's uh, film a, a year or two earlier, uh, The Fortune Cookie, in which in which Lemon was, it, it was a scam. Mathau was a scam artist and using Lemon to try to sue a network television after the Lemon character got injured. Um, but the... So let's then talk a little bit about the background, if you know anything about the background of the series. Um, the <laughs> series uh, was produced by Gary Marshall. He later went on in the 1970s. He had a string of hits. He had Happy Days, uh, Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy, and probably another handful that I'm missing that, that came and went. Um, do you know uh, how Marshall got involved uh, in the show? Yeah, so Gary Marshall, when he got back from Korea, he went to Northwestern for writing. And when he got back from Korea, um, he had met Jerry Belson's brother in the war, and he told him he should look him up. And so at some point, he and Jerry Belson connect. And Jerry Belson, Marshall and Belson are almost like a real life odd couple, as are Klugman and Randall. Um, you know, Marshall describes Marshall went to college, he loved theater. Um, he had a really optimistic, um, easygoing sense of humor and Belson had a very dark hip humor, um, never went to school, never saw a Broadway play. And those two met and they just hit it off as a team, were very complimentary for each other writing. And so they wrote together for quite a while. I know they wrote for Dick Van Dyke, they wrote for, um, Joey Bishop, they wrote for Bill Dana, Lucille Ball a little bit. And so then it, they did the movie The Grasshopper. And I th think that might have been Marshall's first film. And he said he really liked film and he thought he might want to get more into film. But he had a young family. Belson had a young family. And ABC and Paramount called Marshall and said, would you and Belson like to produce the show The Odd Couple? And I guess Belson had to be talked into it a little bit. He wasn't so sure about getting in a TV series that he was stuck in for a while. Um, and Neil Spondon had been stiffed on his contract. He, they gave him a decent movie contract, but television, he didn't realize he had no creative control. He had no say in anything. So I think one of the first things that Belson and Marshall found out once they accepted the assignment was that Neil Simon was furious about the television show. And he was one of their, um, people that they looked up to. So that was really hard for them. Well, it's interesting, though, because uh, the logo, I think for the first three or four seasons, was Neil Simon's The Odd Couple. It wasn't just The Odd Couple, you know, in the opening, it was Neil Simon's The Odd Couple. I think in the last season, they may have dropped it, but... Uh, um, yeah, I was when it was even earlier. Neil Simon made them take that off. Oh. Because... But then later, his daughter convinced him to watch a couple episodes, which he did. And then he called Marshall and said, you know, he actually really enjoyed the show. He liked it a lot. And Marshall said, would you like to make a guest appearance? And he said, sure. So he actually made, he did a cameo on the show. Hmm. So, so uh, let's talk about uh, uh, the show itself. It ran for only five seasons. Um, it was a moderate hit. You know, I mean, if you want to call it a hit, it, middling, let's say. It wasn't a bomb. It wasn't a, a ratings juggernaut like, uh, say, All in the Family was. Um, but it it was uh, critically uh, well-received over the... I think I think uh, uh, Randall got three, nomin th three nominations for Best Actor, and, and uh, Klugman may have gotten two, and they each won at least one, I think, didn't they? They, um, they were both nominated, I think, every single year. They were not, let me see. They were nominated in 71. They were both nominated 72, 73, and 74. So and 75. Oh, okay. Oh, so all of Randall won in 75, and he won in 71, and Klugman won in 73. Hmm. Okay. So, in fact, Randall made a pretty funny speech when he um, accepted his award in 75. He was saying how honored he was and thrilled. He goes, Now I just wish I had a job because. <laughs> Um, yeah. I think the show was always in the top 20. It never hit 21 or one. It was never in that top 10. Yeah. And it was actually canceled every single year at the end of the season and then renewed by August. 
So all five years, it was canceled. <laughs> so let's talk about the two main actors before we uh, get into the characters in the show itself. Um, Tony Randall had crafted himself a pretty good career on Broadway. Uh, he had played bit parts in assorted movies for 20-some years prior to that. Uh, usually light Rock Hudson, Doris Day type comedies. Um, uh, and he also was uh, a regular on the then popular quiz shows. He would be a guest, you know, one of these guests on uh, What's My Line, that kind of thing. Um, uh, what is? What can you tell uh, uh, some people who have never heard of Tony Randall anything more about the man? Um, yeah, I, I think that's a good, he was um, married young. He and his wife loved the New York life. He loved opera. He liked ballet. Um, he loved being in movies. He started a theater that was really near and dear to his heart. Um, he loved improvising, which surprised me because I don't see him as an improviser. But um, yeah, I think he's a very funny, he, I think in a lot of those Doris Day movies that he was in, he kind of stole the scene a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really, I thought he was a good actor. Um, Jack Klugman, not as well known. He was just kind of up and coming when they cast this, but I'd say Tony was definitely an established established star. Well, I know Klugman had been in uh, 12 Angry Men as a film. He was uh, in a handful of uh, uh, the Twilight Zone episodes by Rod Serling. I think the two two of them, I think, are standouts. One where uh, he played the father of a, a son gone off to Vietnam or something, which was one of the earliest references to, to uh, uh, that war. And uh, so, I mean, he, he the thing with Klugman, though, was he was pretty much a dramatic actor, whereas Randall was known for comedy, uh, Klugman was mo was known for drama. And while I enjoyed him as a dramatic actor, I think by far comedy in this show let him shine. And, and you, you saw things that you didn't see before and you didn't even see, an a see after with like Quincy, his long running, uh, where he was a medical examiner show. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, it's probably taken as an article of faith by most uh, people who are fans of The Odd Couple. Uh, you'll often hear that, oh, the first season uh, was not good and uh, it only got going in the second season. But I tend to disagree. I'll, I'll, I, I think that uh, the show was better served in front of a live audience. But any the, the, to say that the first season was somehow bad, I think uh, you really have to... Uh, it's hard to make a case because uh, there's the, I think they did the first adaptation of A Christmas Carol with Oscar as Scrooge. Uh, they had uh, a couple of shows with a snotty next door neighbor kid named Philip, a, a blonde kid with glasses. Uh, they had the Pigeon Sisters, a number of shows like that. And uh, they, they had some recurring characters like Dr. Melnitz was always being called. Uh, and the stuff with the poker buddies. I think in one of the first season episodes, is it Felix is thrown out by Oscar and he moves in with Murray and his wife and they want to kick him back to Oscar. Um, so what is your take about that? Because that was filmed as if it was, I think it was filmed in the same apartment that they used for the film. It was filmed, yeah. it was filmed as if it was a film. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it had a laugh jack. It wasn't in front of a live audience. So what's your take on season one? Yeah, I agree. I think I think the the filming was better when they used a live audience and they used the the camera, the three cameras. But I think I think the only reason it maybe got better later is just I think it started at a high note and it just continued to excel because the characters got more comfortable with each other. Um, they got more comfortable with the writers. Jerry Paris came on as director and everybody loved him. I think it's hard to argue. I don't think anyone could say it wasn't a great show the first season because it was nominated for um, the best new show mm -hmm. and it was nominated for actual best best comedy series right off the bat. So I think that says a lot. Critics really praised the show. And just so people know, in the series, as di different from the, the film and the play, Oscar, I think, is a sports writer, which I think goes through both of them. But Felix was made to be a photographer, uh, uh, you know, uh, portraits especially, where they think he had been like uh, a writer for uh, a paper or, or a, a network in the earlier versions. Um, uh, what, and there, there were a few other changes too. 
what were some of the notable changes? Well, you said you didn't, you hadn't seen the film, um, but right. uh, um, so let's talk then about uh, about uh, some of the the early episodes. To me, one of the best episodes in er season one is when the little boy uh, Philip, the blonde kid who's a little snot nose, uh, is starts peeling off you know twenty dollar bills or something for money he found, and the 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 thrust of the episode is that. Oscar and Felix end up meeting an older version of them, you know, a, a, a fuss budget and a, and and a sloppy guy. And it seems that Felix has accidentally been throwing away the men's hard-earned money. Um, and uh, uh, is that an episode that that stands out? And if not, what are the two or three episodes from season one that you that stick with you most? Um, you know, to be honest, I'm trying to think of, I. I can tell you some of my favorite episodes, but I'm not sure what seasons they were from. Mm -hmm. So um, I know the Pigeon Sisters were popular. They weren't on all that long. Yeah. Um, some of the, is one of the first, there's one where Felix goes missing and the poker buddies have to go yeah, and yeah. try to find him. Yeah. I think that's season one. Yeah. I think those. Um, another, another character that uh, was a favorite of mine was and was introduced, I think, in the second half after the uh, first season one, after the Pigeon Sisters were dropped, was Joan, uh, uh, Dr. Nancy Cunningham, played by Joan Hodgkiss. And I think mm -hmm. she carried over into maybe the end of season two. Um, and I, I really, it was one of, hers was one of the characters that I thought uh, really should have stayed around because uh, in both versions of season one's uh, movie like version and season two's before the live audience, I don't think Oscar had a better chemistry. Yes, he had chemistry with his real life ex-wife or soon to be ex-wife played by uh, uh, Brett Summers. Brett Summers as, as Blanche, right? Uh, she famous for being on the match game later in that decade. Um, but uh, I, I thought that the character of Oscar uh, really shined uh, with Nancy. What was your take on that character? Yeah, I agree. I love them together. You know, it, he was just such like a little boy trying to trying to find ways to go see her to let her know he liked her. And I love their chemistry. And and that she also accepted Felix and all his craziness. Um, and yeah, she just disappeared. Like they never gave an explanation why yeah. she didn't move to her practice anywhere. I and mean, I I thought that was handled pretty badly because the only other person I really remember him where we see him like really seem to fall for someone is um felix is photographing a queen who yeah, is yeah. or princess is there Gene, and you Gene can simmons yeah yeah and and you can see there too that felix or i mean oscar really hasn't it feels a strong attachment to her they really hit it off yeah. but apart from those two relationships but yeah i thought he and nancy were just perfect together and i don't know if they felt that if they carried it too far it would be more about him and nancy than about he and felix um, but then Felix gets a girlfriend with Eleanor Donahue after Nancy kind of disappears. So yeah, Miriam Welby, and the, because <laughs> she played, she played the daughter on Father Knows Best of uh, Young, um, Robert uh, Young, Robert Young. Yeah, they gave her the same last name. So the implication is somehow that that's Doctor Welby's long lost daughter, <laughs> Miriam Welby. But yeah, she was good too. I, I enjoyed her uh, her character as well. Um, and just for the record, it looks like the name of the boy was Christopher Shea, the actor. He played oh, Philip. Okay. And then Bill Quinn played Dr. Melnitz. And Bill Quinn was on loads of show. I remember I, I saw the first episode and did a show on the Rockford Files. And he was in that first episode as a man who gets killed off. But um, they, they were interesting characters. So in reading... I think he's Ginny Newhart's dad, if I have oh, that right. I'm pretty sure yeah. he's... Because I think he played the mailman on the Bob Newhart show, and I'm pretty sure that was Bob's father-in-law. Yeah, I, you're, you're right. I think so. Um, and, and we did we did the, the Newhart show together, didn't we? We did, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, before we move on to season two, uh, it, I know that uh, I was just looking here. Tony Randall uh, apparently was uh, the one that insisted that they go to the more uh, TV-friendly three camera in front of a live audience uh, thing. Uh, and the reason given is that both he and and uh, Klugman uh, hated the sweetening uh, of the laugh track. And 
uh, apparently they uh, went through with a lot of the writers and removed a lot of the initial jokes to build more on character. Um, what what is your take about uh, uh, the laugh track and and how how that differed maybe perhaps between the first and the last four seasons of the show? Yeah, I think Marshall hated it too. Marshall did not like it. He wanted to do a live show as well, but the network put the brakes on that um, until the second year, I think. So that's, then they relented and let them do it the way they should. And I think people wrote in about it too. But yeah, Klugman especially, he hated that laugh track. He said it was just so, so annoying. And um, what else were we talking about besides the laugh track and the cameras? Uh Oh, I was gonna I was gonna go on uh, to uh, uh, one final point before we head on to season two. But uh, uh, one of the things about the odd couple with uh, Marshall, Gary Marshall, is uh, that uh, it seemed to me that that's an outlier in his canon. Because when you look at some of the other shows he did later on after the success of the Odd Couple and then Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and I, Mork and Mindy, uh, he was having you know top. Well, I think. Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days were both number one shows at one point. Um, they were sort of dumbed down compared to the Odd Couple. They, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't. The writing wasn't as good. The characters were sillier. You know, a and the Fonz kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, do you think that Gary Marshall uh, became a victim of his own success in a in a sense? Um, maybe a little bit. I think he really like I. I will say one of my favorite people in television history is um, Sheldon Leonard and Gary Marshall are right up there for me. Um, and I think Gary Marshall has one of the best books ever uh, as far as television. It's called My Happy Days in Hollywood. And um, he is just like the most humble, laid back, unassuming person. Um, very funny. Um, and it talks a lot. I think he loved movies. I think he really enjoyed movies. I think he liked Happy Days. He said he had wanted to do a son or a show that his son and family could watch. And his son said something about, or his son developed Mork and Mindy. He gave him an idea for that. And Happy Days was just him. He wanted to find a show that, that the whole family could watch. And they, so when they did that pilot, you know, it was part of Love American yeah. style. It was called Love in the TV set, I think. And it didn't sell at all. And nobody wanted it. And then when Ron Howard put out American Graffiti, then all of a sudden everybody wanted that. So I think he got thrown into that. I think Laverne and Shirley and Mark and Mindy, yeah, I they were spinoffs of that and probably not. I mean, Shirley, Laverne and Shirley, I guess, has a few moments. But he talks, it's funny when he talks about he was working for Happy Days and he had other people working on Laverne and Shirley and um, Penny Marshall and Cindy Williams, I guess, were just awful to work with. They really got too big quickly. And one of the producers came to him and said, Gary, we're going to have to switch shows because I can't work with your sister anymore. And I'm paraphrasing, but Gary went to work. Then he switched for him. And then he made a comment that, you know what, we have to find someone else to do this because I saw Penny and Cindy standing in the alley yesterday and I wanted to run them over even. So, <laughs> so Penny Marshall apologized for that many times for putting her brother through that. She said she was terrible to work with in that show, and she learned. And if you noticed, she played Myrna Turner in this show, <laughs> uh, Oscar's uh, assistant, I guess, or secretary uh, at, at the paper. And one of the more interesting episodes that I found um, and liked is when uh, uh, her real-life husband, Rob Reiner, uh, from, who played Mike Meathead on uh, All in the Family, guest starred as was it Lennon something or it was uh, Sheldon Sheldon without Sheldon, an O <laughs> right without an O yeah and and uh, uh, now she lasted I think until the end of the series too uh, didn't she or I think she left earlier than that um, to do some things. but yeah I thought and the, the other fun thing about Myrna Turner because she said it Myrna Turner so it rhymed yeah. but then Gary Marshall played her brother Werner Turner yeah. and their sister Ronnie played Verna yeah, yeah. Turner on the show yeah. when she she and um Sheldon got married and I, that's when she went off the show. Okay. Yeah, the thing was that Sheldon's doctor or someone forgot to put the O in Sheldon on his yeah. birth certificate, so he had to go by Sheldon without the O. Before we head on to uh, the second, third, and fourth seasons, I want to talk about some of the more uh, famous gags uh, that that came from uh, the show because you know 
the Sheldon without an O is one of them. I, I remember in season two, it had to be season two because Nancy was still there. They take the, the guys take a trip to a fictional Latin American country and there's this big burly uh, uh, drunkard who uh, uh, Felix does his Calypso song and 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 uh, they get into a fight because he, he's, uh, Oscar calls him Harry Belafonte and the drunk says, you're not Harry Belafonte. And, and they get into a fight there. Um, what was some of the favorite, uh, uh, and that and the one, uh, there were several courtroom scenes. Uh, the, the one where, you know, assume uh, you make an ass of you and me, that famous one. Um, give me a, a few of these, these are, are now, I guess, immortalized on YouTube clips of two or three oh. minutes or whatnot. But they're, they're so great. The, the writing is so good. And Klugman and Randall, I mean, it reminds me really a, a lot of uh, a bit of uh, uh, Abbott and Costello with the wordplay, but also of Groucho Marx. What are some of your favorite uh, little comedic bits? Uh? Um, boy, that's a good question. Um, I think there's probably a couple from the Password episode, oh, yeah. which is one of my favorite. Um, and for uh, those who don't know, Password was a game show that starred Betty White and Alan Fun. I remember my favorite one was when Felix goes, oh, Betty White. He said, oh, I watched your show years and years <laughs> and years ago. <laughs> yep, and she outlived them all. Yeah, yeah, she, was, yeah she was something. Um, so I thought that one was really fun. I know that there was a few um, from the Howard Cosell episodes yeah. There was a couple things that they talked about a lot. I don't know how you feel. People either seem to love or hate the Howard Cosell episodes. Yeah. And I think it was because people either love or hated Howard Cosell. Yeah. And there, um, was, there, was, there was one thing where they're, they're doing singing. Oh, I, there was also the, the one Roy Clark. He plays uh, he plays uh, the guitar there and he does some, some really good guitar licking. And uh, um, then, the, then there's the, the, the one where uh, Oscar is... The, Felix is singing something like that, and Oscar says, "Listen, Mr. Unger, get out!" And uh, so, there, anyone watching the show, the the thing is, uh, it it was a show that f built on character, but that's not to say it didn't have great gags and and, and memorable ones. Like uh, from probably the most memorable one on YouTube, uh, the one with the most hits is now probably uh, "Assume." Do not assume because you make an ass of you and me, and. Uh, but uh, so let's talk about uh, then season two. As we get to season two, we get the the more we, we're with the odd couple as we've gotten to know it. And one of the things that happens is uh, we get to see uh, a bit of Oscar and Felix's family, and also Murray the cop. The the rest of the poker buddies sort of diminish by the end of that second season, and Murray with his big nose, the cop, uh, also becomes uh, more regular. Uh, what are some other highlights do you think from the second season, the first season uh, in the classic format, if you will? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing I thought was odd is you see Felix in his studio off and on during the show quite a bit, but I don't remember seeing Oscar working in his office too often. There, there were a couple. Um, there were there a, was couple. a couple, but not, yeah. But um, yeah, so I think they went up, you know, they went in the subway for one episode and spent the entire right, time in the right. subway. So I think they started going out more. I know Plugman liked the outside episodes. Yeah. But one of the things I thought was really ironic is that in order to get Tony Randall to do this show, they had to convince him to move from New York, which he loved, to L.A. Mm. And then the whole show is an iconic New York show. So I thought that was kind of funny. They made him move from New York and then the show was set in New York and... You would think they're filming there, but they weren't. They were filming in L.A. Yeah. So, uh, as we said, Dr. Nancy Cunningham disappears, I guess, midway through season two. And I don't recall when the first appearance of Blanche, uh, Blanche Brett Summers, Blanche Madison is. But it, I think it might be the end of that season. And we also then get Felix's ex-wife, Gloria, uh, played mm -hmm. by Janice Hansen, who was, from what I read, a real-life Playboy bunny at some point. Um, and there's a, there's a good episode with uh, with uh, Hugh Hefner and, and uh, when Felix gets an assignment for Playboy. Oh, I, I just remembered, which which reminds me, there is an episode in season one that's very similar to Playboy where John Astin plays a very Hugh Hefner-like character and Felix is stuck in a snow lodge with some Playboy-type oh. bunnies. And the actor, uh, what's it, a Albert Brooks, plays... Albert Brooks is in the episode, and he plays a very up-and-coming kind of uh, uh, 
executive, but that, that's a good one. That just came to my mind. Um, uh, but what, what did you think of the two ex-wives, Blanche and Gloria, uh, their, their presences on the show? Yeah, I, I liked them. I thought they added some more dimension. I think, you know, it's funny in real life, Klugman and Summers were also very close um, after they divorced. They remained good friends. Um, and he said, you know, they it was good for their kids because they were close to their kids and they were good friends. And Felix's wife was definitely probably more like Felix was or Tony Randall was married twice. His wife, Florence, passed away during the show. She got ill. And then he married sometime after the show ended. But um, Glory on the show reminded me more of Tony Randall's wives in real life, too. So and then there were his kids. Yeah. My, fav- my favorite uh, episode with Blanche, well, two of them. One is the, the how, they, or how they got Oscar married him, him in the army. It's funny because they do a few flashback episodes, and yet they, they, they still look exactly the same, even it might be 20 or 30 years ago. But the one where where Blanche is is looking to get married to another guy, and 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 first Felix stops the wedding, and then by the end of the, the episode when they get look to get remarried, Oscar's the one who objects to the wedding, and, and Blanche is like, "Thank God." That, I thought that was a, a particularly good episode. But that that brings up another point that people bring up about the show is that unlike modern series where even situation comedies are now episodic, the Odd Couple had to be. The mo- or, or I, I shouldn't say serialized, not episodic. The Odd Couple has to be the most episodic show ever because there had to be at least three or four episodes on how Oscar and Felix met, and they were all different. Yeah, and yeah, that was that was a big goof that the show had. Yeah, but they did it, but they they kept doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. The, that's the thing. I, uh, they apparently met as children when uh, when uh, Felix's father was a dentist or something, uh, running from the mob. Uh, mm-hmm. They. The, the opening narration of the first couple of seasons was on November 15th, uh, Mr. Ungu was asked to remove himself and he went to his old childhood friend, it says. So that implies that that show. But then they they uh, met at uh, in the 1950s at one point and I, then I- In the jury? They, on the jury in, they in met. In the war. Yeah. Well, they said they're in the war yeah, together. They were war buddies. So it, it's like literally every episode practically was its own little universe. Yeah, one of the when you were talking about the wives, one of the things I thought um, was clever was you know so you have Oscar and Felix, two total opposites, and then um, Oscar goes through a dating service to get a date to go on a date with Tony, yeah. and his girlfriend, and it ends up being Tony's ex-wife that he's paired with. Yeah, and then there's another one where uh, uh, Gloria date uh, Gloria dates Nancy Cunningham's boy uh, brother or something, and that in, in the second season. Oh big yeah, hand- he comes to town from New York, and yeah, is that he, the one where he, they meet? And yeah, he he's a handsome guy with what would yeah. be now called a porno mustache of the seventies. He looks very seventies, and and uh, Felix, and and that that's that's a recurring thing too. Even before they brought Gloria on, and even in episodes where Gloria isn't on, Felix is constantly moaning over Gloria. Whereas with Blanche and Oscar, Oscar. Aside from that episode I just said, where Oscar stops the wedding, is constantly wanting to get her off the, the alimony. Um, so there's an interesting contrast there. Um, but uh, let's also talk about the children. Uh, the children, uh, in in looking it up, apparently in both the play and the film, Oscar. There's mention of Oscar having a son named Brucey, but we never see uh, Brucey. Or and Oscar says he doesn't have any kids, but. Uh, he has uh, Leonard, a son. Uh, I should say Felix has Leonard, a son. And what was the daughter's name? Um, Edna. Edna, Maybe. right. Now, Edna originally was played by a young girl who was ubiquitous in the 1970s, Pamela Ferdin. She provided yeah. the voice of uh, uh, the little girl in Charlotte's Web. She was in, you know, every... Lucy other... and Peanuts. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah and she... she and, uh, you know her voice. If, if, if there's something, if there's a voiceover a cartoon character of a little girl from 1968 to 1975, there's a 90% chance it's Pamela and Ferdinand you're hearing. Uh, uh, and then they apparently, uh, maybe only one episode uh, or maybe two in maybe the last season, once the show started uh, getting guest stars every third or fourth episode, they had a Paul Williams episode 
uh, and they had a, a, an actress named Doni Oatman, who was a, a pretty blonde girl, uh, play Edna. Um, what was your take on the, the, the Edna character? Because she was in probably a handful, six or seven episodes, I think. Yeah, I liked her, and I liked the relationship she and Oscar seemed to have. She didn't seem to mince words with him. I think she seemed very comfortable with him. Um, and the boys, I think, were also well-known. They were played with Leif Garrett and Willie Ames, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. So before they went on to to their roles. Um, yeah, I liked the kids. I, You know, in a lot of shows, if you brought kids on or ex-wives on, it would really stunt the comedy. But I think in this show, because it was so much about relationship and the characters, everything seemed to work. There didn't seem to be much you couldn't do on the show. Um, I, we mentioned how by, uh, well, by the end of the second season, I think the only character that uh, other than Murray from the original Poker Buddies that appeared would be Gary Wahlberg's character, Speed. Um, oh. And he, he was in that, that he was in that assume, don't assume court episode um, where they're all pretending to, because Murray decides to be a real cop and wants to bust his bu buddies. Uh, um, but it's, it's interesting because uh, Gary Wahlberg then later went on uh, to co-star in Quincy M.E., uh, Jack Klugman's latest series. Um, uh, what do you know, if anything, about the, the Poker Buddies? I don't know much at all, to be honest. Okay. No, except for Al Molinaro, who I've done a blog on. It just seems like a great guy. And funny. Yeah. he had a very interesting life. Yeah. Not only part of it, very small part of it as an actor. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's something uh, to explore, too. So, uh, oh, and it should be mentioned, uh, just looking here, uh, there was a character actor named Richard Stoll who appeared in something like nine or ten different episodes, and he played a different character all the time. At one time, he was a, he was a preacher. He owned a pet store, um, and, so, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, you, you know the character I'm talking about, right? I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I don't know what his connection. I don't know, because Gary Marshall did you know, cast people. He like Hector Elizondo and Gary Marshall were really good friends. I, they met on a movie scene because Gary Marshall, he was as, um, although he was really humble and unassuming, the one thing he required on every set was a basketball court. Yeah. And so he and Hector Elizondo met playing basketball in a movie. And then he cast Hector Elizondo in every single movie he did, whether there was a part for him or not, <laughs> they became good friends. So, um, so I don't know if he and Stoll had, if he knew him from before, because a lot of, you know, Jerry Pierce was brought on to direct because they had met him on the Dick Van Dyke show and, you know, they got on Dick Van Dyke because they wrote for Danny Thomas. And so there were a lot of relationships that they kept bringing back and led to other things. So, uh, season three and four to me are like the, the two best, uh, seasons, um, the, the show had found its footing. It was, uh, it, you know, it was the second and third season before the audience. By season five, I think the show was still well written. But when you start to rely too much on the guest stars, you know, it's sort of like bringing in a baby into a sitcom. Uh, you're, you're sort of running on fumes. Um, do you agree that seasons three and four were the, the top seasons? And uh, if so, why? Yeah. yeah, I just think they, the characters were so well developed. They knew each other so well. They could... They could be honest with each other. Um, and then they start, yeah, the guess I, I think they overdid the guest stars a little bit. I will yeah. say, I know Plugman always wanted to bring sports people in and they had a ton of them. And then Randall always wanted to get more of the artist. And one of, I'm done, was it Beverly Sills? One of the opera stars, they're like, you'll maybe Leon Teen Price. They said, you'll never get her on. And um, they asked her what she wanted if she came on the show. And she said she just wanted to be kissed once because her character always died. And I thought that was so heartwarming. So she got a kiss. Oscar kissed her at the end of the show. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it, it wasn't Lean Time Price, but I, I, and I was trying to look up here on the top of the uh, oh, Marilyn Maybe. Horn. Marilyn Horn. Oh, okay. Marilyn Horn. Um, yeah, and uh, the, there were so many good episodes uh, in seasons three and four. Um, a lot of, uh, I, I mentioned the character of Doni Oatman, uh, or the, the actress Doni Oatman, who played uh, Edna after Ferdin, uh, I guess, left the show. Uh, uh, 
and there's one episode where she's play she's playing the umpire at a, a, a ball game, uh, and it it really it really goes to show uh, how much Oscar and Felix like each other because Felix again makes a fool of himself in front of his daughter, and it's up to Oscar to to sort of save the day. And a, a similar thing happens. Uh, I think it's Willie Ames' uh, role as Leonard when he's on a little football team, and uh, Oscar ends up coaching the the team. Even though Felix is the de- is the real coach, Oscar's coaching from like the bleachers or you know wh- whatever, looking at things and, and sending out plays. Um, uh, but uh, let's talk then about uh, some of the guest stars because certainly you know that was one of the things that uh, went uh, interestingly. And uh, here, looking on the on the Wikipedia page, uh, basically the guests were either playing themselves or like with. Uh, Marilyn Horn, they were playing uh, characters. Um, and, I, and looking at it, I just want to t- talk about a couple of them because c- a couple of them were from very interesting episodes. Um, uh, Edward Valella was a famous ballet dancer. And that's the, that's the one where they're doing Swan Lake. Uh, and, fe- and Edward Valella, I guess, can't make it. He, to, to, it's like a high school production that Felix is directing or whatnot. And, and uh, Felix is doing, doing the role. And He's doing okay, and he recruits Oscar. And when Valella gets there, they can't get Felix off the stage. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that that one, there's, there's one with Wolfman Jack. We talked about Hugh Hefner one, uh, Alan Ludden and Betty White. Oh, uh, the Bobby Riggs and Billy Jean King episode. Oh. We got to talk about that one because that that's that's a, another classic one. So for those who don't know, I'll just say. Uh, uh, Bobby Riggs was uh, at the time, I guess, a fifty-something-year-old former tennis star. Billie Jean King was the number one female tennis player. They played uh, a match where Billie Jean King beat uh, Bobby Riggs in what was called the Battle of the Sexes. And then, uh, I guess, a year later, they came on the show. Uh, and the premise is that because Bobby Riggs was a well-known gambler, and Oscar's character is a well-known gambler, Oscar basically, <laughs> Oscar cast himself into servitude. Oh no, cast Felix into servitude. Uh, uh, do you remember that episode? Because that, that's they, the best one. I remember them being on it. I don't remember much about that specific episode. That's when I should have gone back and rewatched. Yeah. Uh, and then, as you said, fictional, there are the fictional depictions here. We mentioned the Gene Simmons playing a princess that Oscar falls in love with, Roy Clark, Marilyn Horn. Um, uh, there's another one where Pernell Roberts, who later went on to play on the Trapper John uh, mm-hmm. MD show, uh, plays a sort of country version of a gangster. Um, uh, yeah. He had been on Bonanza. Right, he was on Bonanza. Yeah. Um, Penny Marshall is listed here, although she was Victor Buono. Um, what, who, are there any of these guest stars episodes that stick in your mind? Um, not, not overly, some of them were funny that I think I liked it better when it was just the guys interacting more with everyday life. But, um, just because I think cause so many of these stars did play themselves, it, some of times it felt just a little forced, yeah. like the Howard Cosell one, I couldn't figure out they're at the stadium and going through all that. And then he is irritated with both of them beyond belief. But then the next scene is he's in their apartment, sitting there eating dinner with them. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, let's talk about the, the ending of uh, the show. Um, it was rare uh, in 1975 when the show ended uh, that a show would get a final episode. Cause it, if I think back of like all of the, all of the funny shows uh, from before, I don't think I Love Lucy had a, an ending episode. It just sort of morphed into like the Lucy and Desi show. Gilligan's Island famously was canceled, even though it had great ratings. Um, uh, Maxwell Smart Gets Smart. Um, that didn't have a, a, a final episode. So uh, come 1975, this is one of the first, if not the first, uh, television show that gets an actual end show where you know, they go on with their lives, but, but we get an end to the premise. Um, and I thought that was, I remember as a kid, I remember actually watching it the very night that it aired and I was kind of sad that, that it was ending. Um, uh, what, what can you say about the, that ending show? 
You know, I would say I'm really torn about it. I think, I think the viewers knew eventually that Felix and Gloria were going to end up act together. I mean, it was always kind of pointed that way, but I don't know that I liked that. I liked the way they did the marriage. Um, but I don't know. Part of me had wanted to think that Felix, Felix grew from his time with Oscar and changed and that rather than going back to Gloria, he moved on. I don't know. I guess you could say he learned a lot about how to, to communicate and he learned more about being in a relationship. And so he was a better husband when he went back to Gloria, but. Yeah. I, I love the ending though. When, uh, after the, after the, the wedding, uh, everyone's there and it's just Felix and Oscar and, uh, uh, Felix picks up a, a, a trash can and, and, and throws the garbage on the floor and says, in tribute to you. <laughs> and Oscar says, Oscar says, in tribute to you, I'm going to clean that mess up. And they they yeah. shake hands. Felix goes off and Oscar says, I'm not going to clean that up. Walks away. And Felix <laughs> comes back in. I knew he wasn't going to clean it up. I mean, I, that, that's about the most perfect ending. Because, uh, yes. you know, you, you think of like the MASH ending. Okay, that was a little overly weepy. Uh, same thing with uh, with uh, Mary Tyler Moore, a great show, but a little on the weepy side. But here, the, the, the they're still the characters. After five years of living together, they know each other well enough that that it, it just rings perfect. Yeah, yeah, that is perfect. Yeah, that was perfect. And then they made a TV movie where Gloria kicked him out temporarily so she could plan their daughter's wedding because yeah. he was driving her crazy and he had to go back and live with Oscar. I that I did not see. And I don't know if you saw that or yeah, I remember, I remember if that was that any one. good. That that was after Klugman had uh, throat cancer. Oh no, no jaw cancer or throat, throat cancer. Throat, throat cancer. cancer. Yeah. Um, and you know it was okay. Just just like uh, they then did a movie sequel to the the Matthew Lemon version, which totally ignores the television. The two you know it's again two separate universes yeah. there, and that was that was no good. But that brings up uh, I wanted to talk about um. In the early 1980s, uh, did you ever see the revived version called The New Odd Couple where they had the fellow who played Lamont, Damond Wilson, Lamont from yeah. uh, uh, Sanford and Son, and they had Ron Glass who played, uh, what was it, Ron? Uh, Barney Miller. He Barney, was. Barney um, Miller. Yeah. The, yep. uh, and they, they were, uh, Glass was Felix and Wilson was Oscar. Um and the, the thing there is they reuse some of the exact same episodes. I think it only lasted half a season, 12, 13, 15 episodes at, at the most. Um, what was your take on that reboot? Because to me, it was like, okay, they're black, but why not give them new episodes? Yeah, no, I that I feel the same way. I mean, I am not usually a big re reboot fan, I will say. And that is one thing I've learned with my blogs. I don't think a show's ever been written that lasted more than half a year that has not been rebooted in the last 15 years. It's crazy. And um, how many of the classic shows you look at that have been rebooted and probably not seen by very many people, but yeah, they almost use the same scripts verbatim. I don't know how they, I don't know if cause ABC owned them. I don't know how they got away with that, but I, I didn't love that show. And I didn't love the version that they redid a few years later with Matthew Perry and, um, well, a few years ago is the, the TV or a few years ago. 30, yeah, 30, I didn't care for that one either. Yeah, well, but. that one I think was totally miscast. I thought Felix. I don't. I forget the actor's name. The guy who played Felix in the new one was good. Yeah, Len Lennon. No, I can't. Can't yeah, remember I, his I, name. I think either. it was a guy who's not the Lena. But Matthew Perry from Friends, I seemed totally miscast. Maybe I mean I wasn't a big Friends fan. But he he seemed to me to would have been better as as a Felix rather than an Oscar. Um, uh, yeah, it just didn't feel. Uh, I saw maybe one or two episodes, and I, there was I do remember in the late seventies a, a television cartoon version on Saturday mornings with dogs as Oscar and Felix. Oh yeah, the odd yeah they did cartoons of the Partridge Family, Lost in Space, Gill you name it. Yeah, the odd. I think it was called the Oddball. Yeah, the oddball couple or something. Couple. Yeah. Um, but uh, so uh, you said that every season uh, the show was to be canceled. Um, since they did do a final episode, uh, did did they anticipate being canceled? Or did, I, I would assume they wanted the show to end after five years because when you think about most shows, 
five years seems to be about right. You need at least three years for a classic show, something like, with a rare exception of the honeymooners, say. But that well, that did also go on Jackie Gleason's show. So, um, But uh, you need at least three and maybe seven. After that, you know, especially for comedies, I mean, you look at MASH, great show, but the last few years, very hit and miss. Cheers, very similar, very yeah. hit and miss. You know, you can't go 11 years uh, with a comedy show with the same premise. Um, uh, but five years, I think I think they, they got it right. They, they went out creatively, at least, with, you know, minimal damage to their reputation. Yeah, I think, you know, they always say 100 is kind of that magic number for syndication. Yeah, I think they and like Jack Klugman really pushed. Tony Randall wanted more money up front, and he didn't care about syndication. And Klugman really pushed him and said, no, let's get less money and let's keep our syndication rights. And I think part of it, Randall, was because they were on the chopping block every year. I think Randall was not confident that that was ever going to happen. And so they actually got through 114 episodes. Yeah. But um, Klugman also, his throat cancer issues started that last year towards the end. So I think that probably had, I've never read that he decided not to do it because of that. I just read that the series ended, but I have to think that, you know, that was a concern of his um, because he and Tony Randall went on and portrayed the odd couple on stage yeah. touring across the country for quite some time. Um, but he had just started, just started to notice some issues there in um they made that hundred, so they did. They made way more in syndication than they did from the original show. Yeah, um, and I know, I remember as a kid in like nineteen eighty, there was a local New York version of TV Guide that talked about. I think The Odd Couple was the first syndicated show that made more money as a syndicated series in its first five years in syndication than it did because obviously something like I Love Lucy was playing perennially. Uh, Gilligan's Island by that point was again playing somewhere uh, around there. But The Odd Couple was the first show that wasn't a super hit like Lucy and Gilligan's were that, that really took off in syndication. I think it was one of the shows that first proved that syndication could really uh, be profitable. And I think that helped the actors in terms of being not not just the odd couple actors, but actors in general, uh, the union helped negotiate for for better syndication rights for the actors. Yeah, that, I think that's the only reason we know about the Brady Bunch because the Brady Bunch didn't do that well in ratings at all, yeah. and they barely made it past their hundredth episode. They were basically the network was keeping them alive till they hit that number, yeah. but and they were much more successful than in syndication. Well, they were more successful in syndication, you mean? Yeah, the show. Yeah, when the show was on, it was just not. It was, I don't even know if it ever made the top twenty. Yeah. Um, so um, let's just uh, wrap up. Uh, is there anything else that uh, you can say? Any other facts or anything that uh, we haven't covered that you'd like to get out about the show or the actors or anything else? Um, I think one of I think it's fun to see. They truly were the real life odd couple. I mean, you know, it's funny because Jack Klugman talks about Tony Randall and where Tony Randall was definitely more of an arts and culture kind of guy. Jack Klugman said he was funny because he could, he said he loved the best wine and he'd tell you why, but he also enjoyed a cold beer. And as much as he loved a French meal prepared to perfection, he was quite happy getting KFC mm -hmm. or he'd take him to an art museum and Klugman would come out like overwhelmed with culture and learning. And then Randall would tell him this body joke in the way back to the hotel. Mm -hmm. So he was a very complex person, but in many ways he was Felix, you know, he loved opera. He loved ballet. He liked neatness. He liked control. And Klugman was so much like Oscar. He loved race horses and gambling. Um, the, when they first met, cause Tony Randall did not want Klugman hired. He wanted Mickey Rooney hired for that role. And Gary Marshall and Randall argued about it, and Marshall won out. And um, Marshall said he, the guys were very uncomfortable when they were filming downtown New York, the opening scenes before they went to LA. So he hired a limo for them to get in. And he said they got in this limo for a break, and within two minutes, they were both getting out opposite doors saying, I'm not working with him, can't stand him. 
And it was because Klugman started smoking and it bothered Randall. So just like their characters. And Marshall said, I thought the show was done before it even started. And then he said, so I got another limo. And that's how we handled that. Um, but when Jack Klugman wrote a book called Tony and Me, and it was just so interesting to see. So they come together, very separate, very opposite individuals, not really even liking each other and knowing much about each other. And then they talked about how much they learned from each other. And um, Jack Klugman says in the book, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember, but like, if there's anyone that you love and you care about, tell them. Because I almost, until I had my throat cancer, I didn't tell Tony how much he meant to me, how much I loved him and how much of a friend he was. And Tony really got him through his throat cancer. And then Tony, when he um, got sick, he had bypass surgery and died from pneumonia. And Klugman was very close to he and his second wife. And so he was there all the time for him. And he said they did truly become best friends and, you know, the best friends. So I think their relationship and their lives really mirrored the show, too. Yeah, and I, that reminded me of one of the best shows was when they have a sporting contest uh, and Felix claimed, you know, that he's in much better shape. And he does a little few push-ups and Oscar, you know, can barely run, you know, a quarter of a mile. Uh, uh, but that also reminded me, too, um, there's a famous, uh, in the first or second season, I don't know if it's throughout the end credits of the whole show, but there's a, a scene of Felix with his bags. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's in the opening credits too, uh, where he sits down somewhere on a, a Manhattan street with a couple of big heavy bags of luggage, and he's sitting on it, seemingly distraught. And you see it from like maybe a second or third story window, and some New Yorker comes along. And I, I read a story where uh, where Randall uh, was doing was doing whatever Marshall was having him do just for the the credit scene, and this guy wouldn't go away. He kept wanting to help Randall because Randall was, you know, playing, you know, destroyed. And uh, so that, I found that to be interesting. But one other thing, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but uh, uh, online from, I, I guess it's from the, the original Odd Couple DVD release. And it should be said, uh, you know, uh, the Odd Couple DVD release is bodlerized because they took out most of the music bits, you know, anything with a lot of music. They didn't have the music didn't rights. For it. I, I know years ago I bought uh, uh, from a, a set of the show uh, with everything was in it because it was filmed or, or taken directly from VHS. And it's not the highest quality, but it has all the songs. But anyway, uh, there, there's a back, there's, there's, you know, outtakes and it's Al Molinaro and Felix Doing, you know what a spit take is when you're drinking something, you, go, <laughs> you know, and so, so, so they're doing the spit takes about Oscar and Felix being gay. They don't use the G word. They use the F word there. But but it, it, it's actually hilarious. A two or three minute thing where, you know, I thought, you know, Marie says, I thought you were you were taking it up the ass from Oscar. <laughs> and, and they go back and forth and whatnot. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, so let, let's just end it here and say that uh, uh, if you could give for uh, 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 just concisely why you think The Odd Couple is a great show and why someone who's never seen it would uh, be well off to watch a 50 plus year old show yeah I think it's because it's still really funny you know so many shows date themselves or they're okay but if you go back and you watch The Odd Couple it is just as funny today as it was then yeah. and I think that's because Everybody involved, Jerry Pierce, the director, Gary Marshall, um, Klugman and Randall, they were intent on comedy being true comedy, coming from the characters, coming from their relationship. Not, they said, we don't do jokes, we do relationships. And because the comedy comes from that, it's so well written and so well directed and so well produced. It's just a classic and I think it just will stand the test of time because as long as people are in relationships, and they can drive each other crazy, they can relate. And it doesn't date itself also because I don't think it was stuck on politics. I don't think you ever hear anything about the Vietnam War. Uh, you you maybe get one or two scene, scenes with a black character where someone might say, Oscar might say brother or something. Uh, and I think in the first season, there's an episode where they, they go to a nudie play because Oscar or Felix's girlfriend, who, uh, 
starring in a nudie play like Hair or something. But other than those few things, it's sort of it's sort of like a set in its own universe, and it's it's timeless because it isn't bogged down. Because if you watch All in the Family today, still well written, still well acted show, but maybe a third of the jokes you're not going to have any clue who they're talking about. You know, someone from Nixon's cabinet. But with yeah. Oscar and Felix, because it's always based upon their relationship, you can still identify. So yeah. uh, I want to thank you, Diane. Diana, I'll link to uh, uh, The Right Life 61. Uh, and hopefully in the future we'll do uh, uh, other shows on other topics, uh, other television shows. So thank you for spending about an hour speaking with me. Yeah, thanks. It's been fun.